This video is a little bit different than some of my other ones. I thought I'd try something new. I found a review article from the journal Nature that is entitled SARS-CoV-2 Breakthrough Infections in Vaccinated Individuals, Measurement, Causes, and Impact. It's written by authors Mark Lipsich, Florian Kramer, Jilly Rajev Yoshe, Yanev Lustig, and Ran Balaker. And I apologize if I got any of those names mispronounced. This article is free to download from the Nature Reviews website. I will put a link in the description. And as a result, I don't think I'm in any kind of danger for copyright or anything like that, since it's free public access. Basically, I wanted to read this article, so I figured as long as I was going to be reading it, why not read it aloud? And I know not a lot of people would go and read this whole article themselves. Maybe they would listen to someone read it to them, though. So that's what I thought. Breakthrough infections with severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, in fully vaccinated individuals are receiving intense scrutiny because of their importance in determining how long restrictions to control virus transmission will be needed to remain in place in highly vaccinated populations, as well as in determining the need for additional vaccine doses or changes to the vaccine formulations and or dosing intervals. Measurement of breakthrough infections is challenging outside of randomized, placebo-controlled, double-blind field trials. However, laboratory and observational studies are necessary to understand the impact of waning immunity, viral variants, and other determinants of changing vaccine effectiveness against various levels of coronavirus disease 2019, which is to say COVID-19 severity. Here, we describe the approaches being used to measure vaccine effectiveness and provide a synthesis of the burgeoning literature on the determinants of vaccine effectiveness and breakthrough rates. We argue that rather than trying to tease apart the contributions of factors such as age, viral variants, and time since vaccination, the rates of breakthrough infections are best seen as a consequence of the level of immunity at any moment in an individual, the variant to which that individual is exposed, and the severity of the disease being considered. We also address key open questions concerning the transition to endemicity, the potential need for altered vaccine formulations to track viral variants, the need to identify immune correlates for protection, and the public health challenge of using various tools to counter breakthrough infections including boosters in an era of global vaccine shortages. And now we get into the body of the paper. No vaccine is perfectly effective, even those against yellow fever, which seem to be very close. For a virus like severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, sterilizing immunity is difficult to achieve, even with vaccines, and protection is expected to decline with time since vaccination. Therefore, the key questions for scientists studying breakthrough infections, a term used to describe infections in fully vaccinated people, surround their timing, frequency, causes, severity, and levels of infectiousness. The answers to these questions matter for several reasons. First, identifying the frequency, severity, and causes of breakthrough infections may inform the choice of public health responses. Watchful waiting may be appropriate if breakthroughs are comparatively rare or mild and unlikely to markedly increase transmission rates. By contrast, if breakthrough infections are common, severe, or highly transmissible, then there may be need for additional vaccine doses, changes in vaccine formulations, or non-pharmaceutical interventions, or a combination of these approaches, to reduce the incidence of infection. Identifying the range of clinical outcomes seen in breakthrough infections and determining how severe they can be, as well as which clinical and demographic individual characteristics are associated with severe outcome, will indicate how information about vaccination history can be used in prognostic scores to identify who should receive priority for additional vaccinations or treatments. In this perspective, we first describe the approaches used to measure breakthrough infections and then consider the causes and impact of these breakthrough infections. Finally, we will discuss some of the critical questions that remain to be addressed concerning breakthrough infections. Measuring breakthrough infections. When a population reaches a high enough level of vaccine coverage, most infections will occur in vaccinated people simply because most people are vaccinated. 
Therefore, to interpret the occurrence of breakthrough infections, it is important to compare the incidence rate of breakthrough infections to the rate of non-breakthrough infections in unvaccinated people who, apart from their vaccination status, are similar to the vaccinated. This comparison provides an estimate of vaccine effectiveness. We define vaccine effectiveness, generically to include efficacy as measured in trials, as the proportional reduction caused by vaccination in the probability that a single exposure will give rise to an infection. Measuring vaccine effectiveness is challenging for several reasons. Given the substantial burden of infections before vaccines became available, some individuals who are unvaccinated will nonetheless have some immunity as a result of prior infection, complicating comparisons of immunity between these two groups, although there are approaches to account for this complexity. Additionally, SARS-CoV-2 infection has a spectrum of disease severity from asymptomatic to fatal, and vaccine effectiveness against each outcome may be different. Initial phase 3 randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials mainly used PCR-confirmed symptomatic disease as a primary endpoint, although the Janssen vaccine trial used moderate to severe critical coronavirus disease uh, as its primary endpoint. To measure all infections, whether symptomatic or not, some reported post-trial serological measurements, detecting antibodies to SARS-CoV-2 antigens not contained in the vaccine, as a secondary endpoint, while others estimated the reduction in prevalence of infection among participants tested irrespective of symptoms or asymptomatic participants. Effectiveness against more severe outcomes, such as hospitalization or development of severe, critical, or fatal COVID-19, has also been standard in Phase three trials, although not all trials have had the power to make precise estimates of efficacy against rarer, more severe endpoints or subgroups of the population defined by age or comorbidities. The advantage of randomized trials is that when well-designed and adequately sized, they ensure comparability of the vaccinated and unvaccinated people by assigning vaccination at random and blinding participants and researchers to the vaccine status of each individual. These features promote confidence that any differences observed in infection rates are due to the biological effect of the vaccine rather than due to other differences between those who did and did not receive it. Counteracting this advantage are several important limitations in what randomized controlled trials can measure. For example, a critical public health question at the time of writing is to what extent protection from vaccine declines as time passes or as new viral variants circulate, thus increasing the rate of breakthrough infections given a particular level of exposure. Long-term measurements of vaccine efficacy in phase three randomized controlled trials has been limited because randomized efficacy trials of vaccines offer vaccination to placebo recipients soon after the vaccines became authorized for emergency use. Nonetheless, such data were available for a period of up to six months post-first dose. Moreover, unpublished data from the Open Lab Phase three clinical trials of the Pfizer and Moderna mRNA vaccines compares breakthrough infections during a period in July and August 2021 among individuals randomized to vaccination at the start of the trial versus those originally randomized to placebo who received the vaccine later following unblinding. In each case, breakthroughs were more frequent in the earlier vaccinated individuals providing randomized evidence for waning vaccine efficacy. Uh, now this is me talking. I'm trying to keep my own commentary here to a minimum, but I think this is an important point. What they're saying is uh, that they have evidence that those individuals who received their vaccines further in the past, th those who got their vaccines the earliest, had the highest rate of breakthrough infections, which is indicating to them that there is some reduction in the efficacy of the vaccine over time, which is expected. But importantly, the term breakthrough infections only applies to people who are vaccinated. So it's not saying that people with the vaccine have higher rates uh, of infection or reinfection. In this case, they are only making a very narrow statement comparing groups of people who are vaccinated. Back to the article. Another limitation of randomized controlled trial data 
is that randomized controlled trials have been able to precisely estimate protection against only one viral variant rather than compare protection between variants. The timing of phase three trials was such that in each country, one variant was dominant during the trial period. Efficacy in each country was thus assessed mainly against one variant, and therefore, higher rates of breakthrough infections in a country with, with a certain variant, in particular the beta variant in South Africa, could not conclusively be attributed to the variant as other factors also differenced, uh, differed between the countries. Likewise, each major randomized controlled trial sponsored by the manufacturer of one vaccine has compared that vaccine against a placebo, preventing a head-to-head -head comparison of more than one vaccine in a randomized controlled trial setting. Observational studies have addressed, fully or partially, each of these limitations of randomized controlled trials by comparing rates in unvaccinated people to those in vaccinated people to assess effectiveness during periods of predominance of the Delta variant, comparing effectiveness between Delta and prior variants, comparing different vaccine products, or following vaccinated individuals post-vaccination to assess waning. Observational studies can also achieve higher sample sizes, thereby making precise estimates of vaccine effectiveness in small subgroups of the population. For example, in distinct 10-year age groups, in patients with solid organ tumors, or in pregnant women. In settings with well-followed cohorts, such as integrated healthcare organizations or cohorts of healthcare workers, it has been possible to emulate randomized efficacy trials with cohort studies. In some such studies, vaccinated and unvaccinated persons are matched on a number of potential confounders in order to make them as similar as possible apart from their vaccine status. The availability of gold standard evidence from a randomized trial that the effect of Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccination begins 10 to 14 days after the first dose provided a negative control outcome whereby investigators could assess how well vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals had been matched by showing that no difference in the rate of breakthrough infections occurred during this post-vaccine period. This approach found consistently high effectiveness in the early months after the second dose across various disease outcomes and across multiple subgroups in the population, with some small exceptions. A second perspective observational approach to estimate vaccine effectiveness compares incidence rates of infection and more severe outcomes each week among vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals stratified by age, group, and sex. Such a study in Israel found similar results to those in trials and in observational cohort studies. Retrospective case control studies in which COVID-19 cases are detected and then vaccine status ascertained have been a more common approach to evaluate COVID-19 vaccine status, in part because this approach requires far less infrastructure than prospective designs. The World Health Organization recommends this approach, and specifically the test-negative design in which laboratory-confirmed COVID-19 cases are compared against individuals that are tested for SARS-CoV-2 infection due to similar symptoms but are negative on the test. This approach has been widely used in the past for evaluation of effectiveness of influenza vaccines and numerous other vaccines. It is susceptible to several sources of bias common to other observational studies and some that are specific to this design, yet a number of approaches exist to mitigate these biases, making it a preferred option in many settings. Experience with COVID-19 has stimulated a number of new approaches to estimating, eliminating, or compensating for biases in estimates of vaccine effectiveness, as well as the pioneering of new study designs such as contact tracing-based vaccine effectiveness studies to estimate the reduced risk of COVID-19 infection given a close contact with an infected person. Cohorts of closely monitored healthcare workers have been especially informative in studying vaccine effectiveness, breakthrough infections, and the cause of each of these. In vitro measurements of antibody levels or activity can shed light on comparative risk of breakthrough infections. Neutralization assays provide quantifiable data on the ability of SARS-CoV-2 specific antibodies in a given sample to prevent the virus from infecting cells. While the gold standard neutralization assay uses live virus, the requirement for a biosafety level 3 facility 
and long incubation time prompted the development of SARS-CoV-2 pseudotyped viral particles, which express upon infection only a reporter protein and thus need a shorter incubation time, and can be used under BSL-2 conditions, biosafety level 2 conditions. As SARS-CoV-2 pseudotyped particles contain only the spike protein, they are not suitable for research on the function and processes related to other viral proteins and neutralizing antibodies identified by this approach should be validated using live virus neutralization. However, overall, they are considered a useful virological tool for the study of SARS-CoV-2. When such in vitro measurements are combined with population level or individual level observations of the level of protection a vaccine offers, they can identify immune correlates of protection, neutralizing activity, and to a lesser degree, the quantity of anti-spike IgG, that's a kind of antibody, have been suggested as partial correlates of protection. In vitro measurements of these parameters have shown that they decline with time since vaccination and that there is a reduced activity against some viral variants, providing an independent line of evidence on increased risk of breakthrough infections with time and variants. These can be particularly important for deciding whether a new vaccine formulation is needed to counter breakthrough infections with viral variants. For example, data showing that a third dose of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in the original formulation induced high neutralizing titers against the Delta variant was a consideration in recommending a third dose rather than reformulating the vaccine to track variant evolution. The same has been shown for the Moderna vaccine. Evidence about breakthrough infections should be interpreted in the context of the type of study in which they are measured. The strength of evidence depends on the rigor, size, and quality of individual studies and becomes greatest when multiple approaches to measurement in different settings reach similar conclusions. That's a really good line. I like that. Causes of breakthrough infections. Vaccines against viruses work by generating immune responses that inhibit the infection process, mainly serum antibodies that bind and or neutralize virus particles and, for mucosally applied vaccines, also mucosal secretory IgA, another type of antibody, and creating immune memory in the form of antigen-specific memory B cells and T cells that are primed to produce a rapid anamnestic response when the infection reintroduces the vaccine antigen to the body. These mechanisms can prevent the initial proliferation of the virus or, failing that, rapidly control it reducing the amount of virus to which the host is ultimately exposed and the duration of the exposure. While the amount of circulating antibody present following vaccination or any antigenic stimulus increases rapidly on a timescale of days to weeks, it also declines rapidly from its peak on a timescale of weeks to months, and then more slowly over a timescale of decades. The first phase reflects antibodies secreted by short-lived plasmablast populations, which expand right after antigen exposure as a first line of defense. They typically die within one to two weeks after antigen exposure, and the antibody they secrete declines based on the specific antibody half-life, approximately 21 days for IgG. The second, usually very slow phase of decline likely reflects the kinetics of long-lived plasma cells, which migrate to the bone marrow and from there secrete antibody into the blood, often maintaining stable titers for many years. Importantly, although peripherally injected vaccines can induce low levels of IgG and monomeric IgA antibodies at mucosal surfaces of the upper respiratory tract, which are the main entry portal for respiratory viruses, they do not induce secretory IgA efficiently. The small proportions of IgG and IgA that land on the mucosal surfaces of the upper respiratory tract after intramuscular vaccination disappear relatively quickly as serum antibodies wane. 
Whether a breakthrough infection occurs when a vaccinated host is exposed to an infectious person depends on whether the immune response present in that person at the moment of exposure is sufficient to abort or rapidly control the infection. See figure 1. Given the kinetics of immune responses, it is not surprising that the amount of protection offered by a vaccine against infection might decline over time, allowing more breakthrough infections as the immune response wanes over months, as observed for influenza virus vaccines, and or as immune memory wanes over years, as observed for mumps vaccines. Likewise, Protection might increase after a breakthrough infection or after subsequent vaccine dose, which enhances a person's immune response. It is also unsurprising that older individuals whose neutralizing antibody response to COVID-19 vaccines are typically lower appear to be at greater risk of breakthrough infections at any given time following vaccination. Besides time since vaccination, several factors can modulate vaccine effectiveness and thus the probability of breakthrough infection. Clearly, different COVID-19 vaccines provide different levels of immunity following immunization and thus have varying effectiveness. For some COVID-19 vaccines, there is evidence that increasing the time interval between the first and second dose can increase the immune response and protection. In addition, COVID-19 vaccination is less immunogenic in individuals with various immunocompromising conditions. Moreover, there is evidence that among vaccinated individuals, those with hematological neoplasms experience substantially higher rates of SARS-CoV-2 infection and or severe COVID-19. The genetic variant of SARS-CoV-2 to which one is exposed can also affect the degree of protection offered by vaccine-induced immune responses. In vitro studies show reduced neutralization of some virus variants by sera from vaccinated people. For example, sera from vaccinated individuals showed a 3 to 15 fold reduction in neutralizing titers for beta variant of SARS-CoV-2 and 1.4 to 3 fold lower neutralizing titers for the Delta variant compared with earlier variants of SARS-CoV-2. This in vitro evidence is largely consistent with evidence from epidemiological studies. Uh, now again, I want to point out that they are comparing the immune response, the number of antibodies, the neutralizing titers being produced against the initial strain of SARS-CoV-2 that a person was immunized against to later strains that that person uh, was exposed to. They're not comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. They are comparing the immune system response uh, of a vaccinated person to different viral variants. All else equal. Several studies suggest the probability of breakthrough infection is higher with the Delta variant than with the Alpha variant. Such comparisons are challenging and require assumptions and statistical adjustments because in each location there was only a short period in which the two variants co-circulated and could be directly compared. There is also evidence from case control studies in Qatar and Israel of reduced vaccine effectiveness against the beta variant compared with the alpha variant, although another contact tracing-based study found vaccine effectiveness against the beta variant in exposed individuals to be similar to that previously found against the alpha variant. Modeling and experiences with other vaccines suggest that exposure to a higher viral inoculum can reduce vaccine effectiveness and increase the probability of breakthrough infections. If this effect were important for SARS-CoV-2, it could imply that populations employing better non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as masking, that reduce typical viral inoculums would see higher vaccine effectiveness although any synergy between masking and vaccination is speculative at present. Higher viral exposures could also explain why the Delta variant causes breakthrough infections more than other variants, as in some studies, infection with the Delta variant has been associated with higher viral loads. In addition, there are several other virological factors that could facilitate Delta variant breakthrough infections, including a shorter incubation time, which leaves less time for immune memory to respond and higher fusogenicity of the spike protein.
which may facilitate fusion of the virus at the cell membrane instead of in the endosome, and which may also increase the spread of virus from cell to cell in the lungs, leading to reduced effectiveness of humoral immunity. In the early months after vaccination, mRNA vaccines had efficacy, as measured in randomized controlled trials, and effectiveness, as measured in population-wide observational studies, of well above 90% for a range of disease outcomes, from symptomatic infection to death. These vaccines were also shown to be highly effective irrespective of age group and other factors, although effectiveness against any infection, irrespective of symptoms, was somewhat lower. Given the maximum protection from a vaccine is 100%, we can understand that these determinants might have been comparatively unimportant in the presence of the alpha variant for freshly vaccinated persons in whom nearly everyone would have achieved an adequate level of response to prevent symptomatic infection. As was the case in randomized trials and early observational studies of the mRNA vaccines. As immunity has waned to some degree, the most noticeable declines of vaccine effectiveness have been for asymptomatic infections, in the milder infection outcomes in older individuals, in those vaccinated earliest, and likely in the presence of the Delta variant, with the vaccines that were initially less protective against infection or symptomatic infection, such as adenoviral vector vaccines, there was evidence of greater efficacy against severe outcomes even in the initial trials. As it usually takes several days from initial SARS-CoV-2 infection to development of severe disease, it is plausible that this time frame is sufficient for the memory immune response to become effective. The longer time available to mount an effective immune response before severe disease sets in may be the reason for a relatively high vaccine efficacy against severe disease observed even as time since vaccination passes and with the Delta variant circulation. The greater effectiveness, that is, equivalently lower degree of vaccine-induced immunity required, for more severe outcomes is consistent with that observed for vaccines against other respiratory infections, such as streptococcus pneumoniae and the influenza virus. If variants, waning immunity, and age all contribute to breakthrough infections, what is the relative contribution of each of these? While this is a natural question, we propose that given observations to date with COVID-19, there is no simple answer, even in principle. Rather, we argue that the data are consistent with a model, displayed in Figure 1, in which the degree of protection depends on the strength of immunity at the moment when an individual is exposed. This level depends on several factors. The initial immune response is lower in older adults and declines in all individuals from peak in the early weeks after vaccination. Moreover, higher levels of immunity are required to prevent milder disease, as described above, and to protect against the Delta variant compared with the Alpha variant for any given severity level. This model implies that age sets a lower peak response, time reduces the response, and different variants are differentially affected by the response. While sera from vaccinated individuals neutralized the Delta variant less efficiently than earlier variants, individuals boosted with a third dose of the mRNA vaccine neutralized Delta efficiently. Even though that third dose encodes the original SARS-CoV-2 sp spike protein rather than a Delta variant-specific spike protein. Moreover, individuals with a third dose are significantly protected against infection at a time when Delta is circulating. The ability of quantity to compensate for quality in immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 variants, and in particular, the fact that vaccines designed against older variants, although showing somewhat lower neutralization against later variants such as Delta, can nonetheless be protective against infection and severe outcomes with these later variants when they achieve high enough titers may or may not be a general phenomenon. It is imaginable that future variants of SARS-CoV-2 
may arise in which escape from immunity is so complete that boosting with the original spike protein is ineffectual. In this case, a short-term public health response to an increase in severe breakthrough infections would be to reimpose social measures to slow transmission, while a medium-term solution would be to develop and rapidly deploy vaccines that more closely match the circulating variant. One advantage that has been touted for mRNA vaccines is the ability to rapidly change the antigen. Such updates could follow the approach by which influenza vaccinations are updated, as influenza viruses change antigenically. A challenge for regulators will be to determine whether vaccines targeting such novel antigenic variants of SARS-CoV-2 will require full human safety and efficacy trials, or whether, as for influenza virus vaccinations, they can be treated as strain changes to already proven vaccines and given more limited testing to speed their availability. Impacts of Breakthrough Infections The nature and scale of response to breakthrough infections with SARS-CoV-2 depends on their severity, distribution in the population, and contribution to transmission. At one extreme, mild breakthrough infections that are not very infectious pose little danger to the vaccinated person and little danger of fueling future surges and indeed may boost the individual's immune response. Such cases would call for little or no public health response beyond monitoring. Early experience in the era of Alpha, when most vaccinated individuals had received their vaccines only in recent months, showed lower viral loads in those with breakthrough infections, and measured viral RNA levels were correlated with low antibody levels around the time of infection. Soon after vaccinations and in the era of alpha, vaccination reduced household transmission to unvaccinated individuals. Evidence on the infectiousness of Delta variant breakthrough cases remains limited. At the time of writing, it consists largely, though not exclusively, of viral RNA quantification at a single point in time. A third dose seems to reduce viral loads in breakthrough infections, including with the Delta variant. Measuring the infectiousness of breakthrough infections has several subtleties. The most common quantitative measure of viral load is the PCR cycle threshold, CT which measures how many cycles of PCR are required to amplify the DNA made from viral RNA to a detectable level. So that larger numbers means smaller amounts of viral RNA. While the CT value is often taken as a measurement of infectiousness, studies have found that for a given CT level, the probability of testing positive by other measures of infectiousness, such as antigen tests or viral culture, in vaccinated than in unvaccinated individuals. One interpretation is that more of the viral RNA is shed by vaccinated people whose infections are non-viable, so such breakthrough infections may be less infectious even if they have the same CT as an infection in an unvaccinated person. A further issue is that single time point measures of viral load may depend on host factors other than vaccination and may also reflect the rate of growth or decline in a particular viral variant in the host population, further complicating interpretation. Contact tracing-based studies are another approach that more directly measures the infectiousness of breakthrough cases, comparing the probability of infection in contacts of vaccinated index cases versus unvaccinated ones. A preprint study from the UK showed that vaccinated index cases were less likely to infect their contacts. Additionally, it found that the Pfizer vaccine was more protective than the AstraZeneca vaccine and that each vaccine was more protective against transmission of the alpha variant than the delta variant. Because vaccination may change the kinetics of viral shedding and the relationship between viral load and symptoms, interventions directed at individual people who are infected, such as isolation and contact tracing, may be more or less effective and thus may need to be modified if breakthrough cases are common and infectious. More generally, the degree of infectiousness of breakthrough cases may inform planning and response to prevent additional surges.
COVID-19 is associated with a plethora of sequelae on patient health and well-being. Some of these are abrupt, but others may linger for prolonged periods of time. These may extend beyond the acute pulmonary inflammation and generalized inflammatory response to include additional complications for which the underlying mechanisms are less clear. These post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection have been observed in both severe and mild or even asymptomatic cases of SARS-CoV-2 infection, but are significantly reduced in breakthrough cases. Oh, okay. So, uh, sequela are um, health conditions that arise from having previous uh, diseases or, or um, uh, health problems. So what this is saying is that there are a number of different sequelae that are associated with COVID-19 infection, uh, but they are less common in association with the breakthrough infection. So having your vaccine offers you protection about from some of the uh, ongoing or lasting health problems that follow the initial infection. At least that's my interpretation of, of what that uh, paragraph means. Despite the strong protection that vaccination provides against severe outcomes, breakthrough infections have been shown to progress to severe illness at non-negligible rates. In late July to early August 2021, at the outset of a surge in, of cases in Israel, the majority of severe COVID-19 cases were documented amongst individuals who had been vaccinated with two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. These cases occurred at a time when most of the high-risk age groups were more equal to or five months past their second vaccine dose, and this was a factor in leading Israel to offer a third dose of the vaccine, which drastically reduced the incidence of severe disease in those who received it across age groups. In children, a severe manifestation of SARS-CoV-2 infection is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MIS-C, which requires intensive care in the majority of cases. In unvaccinated populations, MIS-C has been shown to occur in around one in every 3,200 children post-infection and to mostly occur in previously healthy children. At the time of writing, there are insufficient data to fully characterize the impact that vaccinating children against COVID-19 has on MISC. However, by preventing serious SARS-CoV-2 infection, vaccination of children is expected to substantially reduce the incidence of MISC. It remains to be seen whether SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infections that occur in the vaccinated children will have a reduced likelihood of le leading to MISC compared with SARS-CoV-2 infections in unvaccinated children. Several individual characteristics have been shown to be associated with a higher incidence of severe illness in individuals infected with SARS-CoV-2 infection, including older age, immunosuppression, specific comorbidities such as chronic cardiovascular, pulmonary, renal, liver, and neurological diseases, advanced pregnancy, heavy smoking. Individuals with such risk factors therefore usually comprise the majority of severe COVID-19 cases. Vaccine effectiveness against severe illness is generally expected to be higher than against infection or mild illness as it combines the lower likelihood for infection and the lower likelihood of those who are infected of having severe complications. Estimating the protective effect of vaccination against severe illness from descriptive population level statistics is non-trivial. For instance, in a population with lower average vaccine uptake, but a very high uptake among the key risk groups, namely the elderly and the chronically ill, severe cases might still be expected to occur disproportionately among those vaccinated even if vaccine effectiveness is very high. It would be plausible to assume that the clinical impact of SARS-CoV-2 infection could also differ by the level of immunity prior to exposure, even if this level did not suffice to completely prevent infection altogether. 
Yet, large retrospective studies that compare severe clinical outcomes of breakthrough cases with primary infection cases adequately adjusting for individual level confounders are yet to be published. The susceptibility of specific vaccinated population subgroups to breakthrough infections has implications for the prioritization policy during booster vaccination campaigns. Such at-risk population subgroups could also drive differential policy on non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as self-quarantine rules when a vaccinated individual is exposed to infection. Identifying subgroups at a uniquely high risk for severe breakthrough infections is also key in prioritizing early preventative treatment or prophylaxis, such as monoclonal antibody products that may be scarce and costly. Accurate prognostic scores that account for vaccination in identifying early in their course those at greatest risk of severe outcomes are especially important for therapeutics that are most effective when given early in infection prior to the appearance of severe disease. In the context of debate, in spring 2021, over the idea of delaying second doses to extend supply, it was argued that breakthrough infections in individuals with low levels of immunity following a single vaccine dose would likely accelerate the rise of variants that escape immunity. If correct, the same logic could apply to breakthrough infections following a full two-dose series, especially after significant waning. However, one of us has argued previously that the acute nature of infection, probably shortened by further vaccination, makes the emergence of an immune escape variant during an infection very unlikely, at least in an immunocompetent individual. Likewise, in influenza virus infection, vaccine-derived immunity seems to contribute minimally to selective pressure for immune escape. Therefore, it appears that while each infection poses some risk of generating a variant that is capable of escaping immunity and a higher incidence and prevalence of infections thus increases the risk, breakthrough infections per se may not be of specific concern regarding the generation or amplification of immune escape variants. Nevertheless, the issue is complex and speculative, and the outcome may depend on the quantitative details of the comparative susceptibility of vaccinated individuals to infection with and the transmission of different variants. Unprecedented data, but many open questions. In countries that have large supplies, the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines has occurred with unprecedented speed and under unprecedented scrutiny, perhaps best exemplified by the fact that multiple studies have produced a measurement of vaccine effectiveness on each individual day post-immunization. At the same time, detailed antibody kinetics have been measured in thousands of individuals, providing more data on the temporal patterns of immune response than for any past vaccine, if not throughout history, then at least in the first uh, few months of deployment. Also unprecedented, or at least never previously documented, has been the emergence over a timescale of months of variants that, to varying degrees, have reduced susceptibility to immunity from prior natural infections and or from vaccines. The presence of multiple such variants over a short period of calendar time has allowed comparisons of vaccine effectiveness against different variants that have only rarely been possible for other pathogens. Despite the unprecedented speed and scale of data accumulating on breakthrough infections and related topics, several important questions remain open. For example, although there is evidence that vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 reduce transmission in households and communities, it has been argued that sustained high levels of herd immunity against SARS-CoV-2 infection may be an impossible goal for vaccination, given that it is a mucosal infection without an obligate stage of dissemination through lymph or blood. In this scenario, even with high vaccine coverage, some combination of waning immunity and antigenic variation will produce enough susceptibility in the population to maintain endemic transmission of SARS-CoV-2 for the foreseeable future. 
likely similar to what is seen for other coronaviruses circulating in the human population. Nevertheless, this situation seems unlikely to produce the same level of disruption that has been seen in the first year and a half of the COVID-19 pandemic. Pandemics are rare events in which all or nearly all humans lack exposure to a novel pathogen and are thus at risk for severe disease and transmission, particularly in this case those who are older and have certain comorbidities. As with the influenza virus, or even more so with human coronaviruses, this pandemic pattern may gradually fade in a pattern of milder disease because virtually everyone will experience multiple exposures through one or more vaccine doses and or one or more exposures to viral, possibly breakthrough, infections. On this view, the role of vaccines is not to provide durable herd immunity as with measles or smallpox, but to prevent severe outcomes during the transition to endemicity. Other key scientific and public health questions arise in the short term. The appropriate balance in tackling Delta variant-driven surges between non-pharmaceutical interventions and booster dose vaccination campaigns is under fierce debate in many countries. Some countries that attempt to drop all non-pharmaceutical interventions after reaching high levels of vaccine coverage were forced to reinstate most. For example, vaccination passes, indoor face masks, in the face of massive resurgence while applying a population-wide third dose mass vaccination campaign to avoid the need for further restrictions. Other countries have more gradually relaxed some non-pharmaceutical interventions and performed more gradual and age-dependent third dose vaccination campaigns or did not experience a strong wave of Delta variant infections. As new variants will likely emerge, and as more countries experience waning immunity to an increasing extent, these debates will likely intensify in the view of global shortages in vaccine supply for primary vaccination, which is particularly acute in low-income and lower-middle-income countries. Another question is whether there is an instantaneous immune correlate of protection, that is, a measurement of individual level immune responses that can predict at any moment in time how protected that individual is against breakthrough infection. Neutralizing antibody titers during the first months after vaccination appear to be well correlated with vaccine effectiveness as measured in randomized trials and are predictive of the risk of breakthrough infections in individuals. However, no specific antibody or neutralizing threshold titer has yet been identified that can predict the degree of protection as it changes over time with waning or boosting. Clearly, as time passes, it will be important to design studies to assess the relationship between measurements of immune responses and the risk of reinfection. Such studies are challenging because of the need for relatively frequent samples, for example, serum samples or measurement of immune cells taken from near the time of exposure from large numbers of people, most of whom will not become infected in any short period of time. Innovations in study design can help to make such studies more efficient, as could lower cost, less invasive means of obtaining blood or other biological samples. Some work also indicates that if diagnosis is prompt, it may also be possible to estimate the levels of antibodies present at the time of exposure by obtaining blood on the day of diagnosis or the next day before antibody levels have appreciably risen in response to the infection. At the time of writing, critics of the use of third doses to boost immunity in individuals of equal to or greater than five months out from their second dose have noted that the evidence of significant waning has not been observed for all vaccine products and in all age groups. Proponents of boosters for large groups of the population implicitly assume that the documented increasing risk of breakthrough infections in those who are exposed to the Delta variant are older, were vaccinated earlier, and received certain vaccine products are harbingers of similar declines in younger populations with future variants. This expectation is consistent with our simple model if levels of protective immunity continue to decline substantially after the first six months. This remains to be seen in some groups and for some vaccine products. 
at least for protection against severe outcomes. Detecting such waning may require especially large sample sizes in lower risk age groups. Importantly, for the Pfizer vaccine in Israel, there is now evidence that at least in the first several weeks after vaccination, a third dose confers a greater than 90% further reduction in the risk of hospitalization and severe disease in each age group compared to the first two doses. Another question is whether a third dose administered months after the second dose will be qualitatively different from the second dose and provide enhanced long-term protection against breakthroughs or whether protection levels will return to the pre-boost level or lower once again in a matter of months. More generally, there is a need to set up continuing studies to understand how an individual's degree of protection against the occurrence and severity of breakthrough infection depends on that individual's prior history of exposure to active infection and by vaccination against SARS-CoV-2. Related to these scientific questions is the practical question of how to use limited vaccine supplies to maximize the longevity of effective immune responses. In this regard, growing evidence of higher immunogenicity for two-dose regimens with a longer interval between doses should prompt serious consideration of increasing the standard interval with additional trials necessary to meet regulatory requirements. A robust system to monitor duration of protection, impacts of variance on vaccine effectiveness, and a simple and fast system that allows quick and easy adaptation of vaccine antigens and dosing intervals in the future is urgently needed. This article was published online on the 7th of December 2021 and is available uh, from the Journal Nature's website.